coming year the last week, uh, we are actually going to do it this week. So we're going to get into what God has been telling the board and the pastors uh, about where this church is headed and some of the accomplishments we did. And we will get into the word, don't worry, because we have to get fed. Amen? Amen. Yeah, I, I heard one amen. Thank you, Randy. Uh, by the way, Randy goes in for surgery Tuesday. And uh, I just want to shoot up a prayer uh, for him real quick. Could you join me? Father God, we thank you, Lord, that uh, you love us, that you hold us in the palm of your hand. God, we thank you that we, every one of us here, are precious in your sight, that you love us so much. So God, we ask that you would hold Randy during that surgery, that everything would go well, that you would guide the physician's and surgeon's hands. God, that uh, everything would heal up completely and he would be restored better than you. And Father, for uh, Mark Greco and other people that are sick in our midst, God, I pray that you would heal them up, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, um, this year, what God really put on our heart is obedience. It's not just reading the Word of God, but becoming obedient children to the Word of God. Next year, Kevin told me he's going to hold me to this. I think it's going to be faithfulness. And uh, then we're going to have to persevere and endure to the end. You know, I, I really see a church that's become the spotless bride of Christ. I see a church functioning as a body where the Bible says, if one member hurts, how do you finish that verse? Everybody, Everybody hurts. You see, it's very rare and very hard to find a church that's actually functioning the way God intended the church to function. You know, there's many hurting people, and I've been uh, even on staff in churches before, where it's so big that it's hard for everyone to hurt when one member hurts. And I believe in the, in the days ahead, it's going to be imperative that the church really becomes that functioning body. I believe as we see events take place around the world, uh, we're going to have to really begin to shine our light in the midst of darkness. We're going to fulfill the Great Commission. I see a church that's reaching lost sheep. Not just the lost of the world that don't know Christ, but there's many Christians who think they know Christ, but they're actually on the wide path that goes out. God has been speaking to the pastoral staff and the board, and here's a synopsis of what he's been telling all of us, and some of you have had uh, uh, input on that as too. We need unity in the body of Christ and trust with one another. We need to rely on the Spirit more than ever in the days of head. There is no middle ground. In the church of Laodicea, in Revelation chapter 3, they tried to play the middle. And what did Jesus say? We read it last week. Hey, because you're lukewarm, because you're not hot or cold, you're, you're playing the middle ground, you're trying to please man rather than God, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Feeble Christians will fall away. And over and over, as we read prophecies about the church in the last days, there's one marker that, that, that is a sad marker for the church. Many are going to fall away from the truth. Many will be deceived. It's time to do things God's way, not man's way, or traditions, or anything like that. We want to be a church that lines up solely with this book. Uh, that's the only thing that matters. It's time to put on the real armor of God, not play armor. And Pam had this kind of vision about the church, and we were at this wall, and the enemy was on the other side, and I was trying to dig through the wall to get to the enemy, and Pam's like, not yet, we're not ready. Everyone has play armor on. Just toys, not the real thing. I believe in the days ahead, we will figure out what it means to fight the good fight. To put on the armor of life. To be good Christian soldiers of the cross. We need to get ready for testing. And Pastor Mark shared that uh, last week at the end of the service. He said, God told me when I asked him, what's God been telling you for the church about the year ahead? And he said, get ready for testing. And a couple hours later, he went through, he and J.D. in a huge test. <laughs> He's like, I didn't know it was for me. We need to trust, we need to support one another, we need to communicate, and we need to obey Christ and his word above all. 
And Pastor Harry said, you know, there comes a time and God put Nehemiah chapter 2 on my heart. You know, Nehemiah was in a foreign king's court. But he found favor with that king, right? And the king actually gave him papers to go rebuild Jerusalem and the walls. And Harry said, we're going to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. But there will be people in the world that aren't believers that, uh, you know, a righteous man has a favor of God and the favor of men. Does that make sense? And so it could be there's some alliances, obviously not unequally doped, but uh, talk to Pastor Harry more about that. Turn to Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. <clears throat> I like go eat popcorn, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, but General Electric Power Company works as well. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12, you read this. So as those who have been chosen of God, are we all chosen? Amen. Yes, we are. Holy and beloved, are we all holy? You know, holiness is a lost and forgotten topic in church. I believe in the year ahead, God is going to call us all to holiness. I preached a sermon about a year and a half ago, actually a whole series on the holiness of God. And folks, we need to get in line with that. For those chosen, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. That's with one another, with kindness with humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should. Beyond all of these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God and whatever you do. Well, I'm just a housewife. I don't do anything for God's kingdom. No, God's placed you there. Amen? Amen. Well, I just work at the gas station. God's put you there for a reason. Whatever you do. I'm just a student in school. I hate it. I have to jump through these academic hoops. Whatever you do, even if it's going to a boring class and memorizing a bunch of junk, you'll just forget for a test. Do what? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him, to God the Father. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it's up there. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. In the days ahead, we are going to have to be a zealous people for God first, but zealous for whatever position God has placed us in life to do it unto the Lord. Whatever menial job you think you have, God's placed you there for, for a purpose. There's a reason you're there. Whatever trial you're going through this morning, God has put you in that circumstance for a purpose. Figure out why you're there and begin to blossom and bloom where he has planted you. We need to press into a new level of holiness and intimacy with the Lord. We need to be busy doing what God has called us to do. Not what we have purpose in our heart to do. I believe it's going to be very important that we seek God for direction. Uh, the mantra of our Bible college is ministry is not a future goal, it's a daily call. God put that on my heart because when I went to Bible college... I thought, okay, I have to finish Bible college before I can minister. What happened, that call, that zeal that I had in my life for God, 
during the course of going through all the academics, began to fade. And by the time I graduated, I didn't even remember that real strong supernatural call. That's why I always say ministry starts right now. If you're not ministering now just because you get a degree, doesn't mean you're going to minister now. Every day it needs to be about obedience to the Lord um, and humbly serving Him. Faith leads to obedience. We talked about it last week. 1 Peter 1.22 Since then you have obeyed obedience to the truth, have purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, 1 John 2, 4, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Let me ask you, are you being obedient to the Lord in every area of your life? If you are, you're going to experience the blessing of God in your life and the provision and the leading of the Holy Spirit. In the days ahead, false teachers are going to arise. The Bible tells us over and over again. They say we only need to agree on the essentials. In our homiletics class this past week, we figured out that the whole thing is essential. In our Sunday night class where we're studying hermeneutics, and I know it sounds all goofy and academic, but it's really how to study Bible prophecy. And we figured out that, guess what, the whole book is prophecy. There's two types, right? Didactic and predictive. <coughs> So the whole Bible is important. They've developed their own doctrine and teaching and tradition. And Matthew 15, 6, B says, You invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition or your doctrine. And many churches have done that. In fact, they told me, well, you know, that whole chapter doesn't apply to us. Or those verses don't apply to us. The ones before it do, but not the ones after. You ever hear that? The modern version of tolerance is overlooking one's sin or covering one's sin. Do you know Christians use a verse to justify that? Turn, if you would, to James chapter 5. It's on the board if you don't have your Bible. Right after Hebrews, way in the back. Before 1st and 2nd Peter. James chapter 5, starting at verse 19. It says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth. Notice he doesn't say sin there, but we're going to find out that the very definition of sin is straying from the truth, not obedience. And one turns him back, verse 20. Let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And I've actually heard some Christians say, what that verse means is that, hey, there's Christians, we all sin, and so even though they're practicing sin, just, just cover it, just love them anyway. Because they're teaching false doctrine and it doesn't line up with Scripture, just love them anyway. Just focus on the one essential, Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, when in fact the whole thing is Essential. The word sinner there is harmatolos, and it literally in the Greek means to deviate from truth, to miss the mark of God's commands, sin, erring from the divine law, practicing and teaching false doctrine, and it's serious. Verse 20, let him know with that definition of, of uh, cover, let him know that the one who turns a man who teaches or practices anything contrary to the commands of Christ and the word of God, in error rather than in sound doctrine, will save his soul from death. Paul turned Hymenius and Alexander over to Satan so that they would be taught not to blaspheme. You think this is serious stuff? In the days ahead, it is going to be imperative that you are in the word of God. That you don't just read catechisms or a doctrinal statement, but you yourself are grounded in the Word of God because error is all around us. Fact of the matter is, that death, when a soul dies, is the final judgment. So we see there's people in the church, false teachers, that are erring or straying from the truth contextually, and their soul is going to die in 
the second deck. They're not going to make it. That's serious stuff. We need to correct false teaching. Do you believe that? Have you ever met a Christian that believed that, oh man, it, it, it's okay to, you know, ordain <clears throat> homosexuals? There's whole denominations that embrace that. Did you correct them? The hardest thing to do is to correct a Christian who strays from the truth. And yet we just read in that verse, it's so important to do that, you will save their soul, that's the final judgment, from death. Problematic portion of that text is uh, verse 20. Look at that in your Bibles. Let him know who him who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death. That's the final judgment. And will cover a multitude of sins. Do you think we can cover sins? We can't. In fact, in the new covenant, your sins aren't covered. What are they? They're washed by the blood of Christ. When he died on Calvary, we were washed clean by his blood. And every time we sin, we run to the cross and we're washed clean again. It's like our baptismal over here. You know, taking a shower, getting washed. Wouldn't that be fun? I want to do a baptism. I, I really do. In, in that. <laughs> that would be so fun. I don't know. <sighs> So what does it really mean to cover? The word in the Greek, cover from Thayer's lexicon, is to hide or veil, to hinder the knowledge of a thing, to stop it from continuing to be taught or learned. Interesting. Now with that definition of cover, and this definition of sin, to miss the mark, to err, be mistaken, or fall away from the truth, that verse now makes sense. It would read something more like this. When we reprove or correct false teaching, we cover, literally hinder the knowledge of a thing, prevent it from continuing to be taught a multitude of sins wandering or straying from the truth of God. That's what we do. So we hinder false teaching, and we lead, uh, which uh, leads people to disobey the clear teaching of Scripture. We don't cover sin. We need to stand for truth in these days ahead. The more I get together, and every week I, I meet with several pastors in the area, the more they are seemingly all kind of slipping down that slope towards, well, it's okay, and you're causing this unity because I'm standing just for what this says. Well, who's really causing this unity? Those that stray from the truth? Or those that are abiding in the truth. Hmm. Titus 1.13. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely. So that they may be sound in faith. I'm glad Pastor Mark isn't in this message. Because God has called him to that. He might just get fired out, up and really go out and reprove people severely. <laughs> you know. Uh. Remember the quote uh, I sent out in email? Um, correction without love. How did, how did it go? Truth without love is brutality, but love without correction, truth, is hypocrisy. Mm. 114. Not paying attention to Jewish myths and the commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Anytime someone says, well, that chapter in that book doesn't apply to us, that scares me. Because what they've done is said, you know what? They've invalidated the Word of God. That one really doesn't apply to me. The enemy, can't you see him telling Eve in the garden? Did he really say that? Oh, that doesn't apply to you. We need to correct, reprove, and warn those who ignore the teachings of Scripture. And folks, what Scripture is essential? Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is inspired by God 
and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And we are accountable to the truth. You know that. Is it a command of Christ to go reprove, rebuke, and exhort and correct people? Why do you think it's so hard to do it? If you've ever done it, it's hard. I remember one time I was teaching an evangelism class, and we met at Mission Viejo Mall. And we were in the food court going through the Bible. We all had our Bibles before we went out to evangelize. And a group of women came up, and real short hair, and one of them had the collar on. And she was like, oh, what are you guys studying? And I go, and we were right at the part where I don't allow a woman to have authority over a man or teach a man in the pastoral epistles. And I go, man, I, a wonderful verse that I think you should read. And she read it. But for a minute, I wanted to shut my Bible and just say, hey, God bless you. You know, what church are you a pastor of? But I had to correct her. We must correct Folks, if you have friends that attend a denomination that's straying from this book, it's your obligation. In fact, it's a command of Jesus Christ to correct them. And Jesus said, if you love me, you what? Keep my commandments. We know the story of the watchman in Ezekiel 33. Hey, if he sees danger coming and doesn't warn the people, the blood is on whose hands? The watchman's hands. We need, in the days ahead, to correct false doctrine and false practice. As the watchman, we need to teach and obey the full counsel of God's word. Paul did it in Acts 20, 26 and 27. He says, Therefore I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the full counsel, the whole counsel of God, the word of God. It's all about obedience and teaching that full counsel. Our theme verse at Living Water, we have two, 1 Timothy 3.15, but in case I'm delayed, Paul writing, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. That's the church. The church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. When the church no longer supports truth, Truth will fall to the ground. And folks, the church has long since stopped supporting truth. Dietrich Bonhoeffer visited America. Do you, do you know who that is? I mean, he was a, a great man that lived in Nazi Germany. He came to America. He taught. He was a pastor. And he stood for truth. He said, back then, when I came to America and spent time here, I didn't find one service where they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it was more commentary on the latest newspaper articles. Hmm. Turn to Isaiah 55, starting at verse 1. By the way, Dietrich Bonhoeffer preached against uh, Nazis, actually uh, was part of a plot to assassinate um, Hitler, and ended up being killed. Isaiah 55, starting in verse 1, it says, Hope, don't you love that? <clears throat> it's kind of like yeehaw is really our, our expression. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you have no money, come buy, eat, come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Behold, I have been with, uh, made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation... You do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel. By the way, that could be a reference to America. Isn't that kind of interesting that we are the ones supporting Israel and help them rise to power? 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. And folks, in the days ahead, darkness is coming. A storm is coming. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. Whatever's in your life that's been plaguing you, that the guilt is too hard to bear, today is the day to repent, to lay it at the foot of the cross, and to begin to live a holy life before a holy God. He will abundantly pardon you. Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Pastor Harry got this verse from the Lord when we were praying about uh, what lies ahead. Nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word. Is this the whole Bible? Yes. Be which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy. Don't you love that? And you will be led forth with peace. And the mountains and the hills will break forth with shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Won't that be amazing? No matter how depressed you are this morning, no matter what anguish or what's plaguing your thought, this weight that's on your mind this morning, God wants to set you free from that. And he wants you to go out of this building today with shouts of joy, refreshed in the Lord. See, the word, the Bible says, it's like a husband when he washes his wife with what? The water of the word. The word washes us and cleanses us, and refreshes us, and renews us. For living water, I see a church that equips, encourages, enables, energizes, extends, and is an example of what a true biblical church should be and do in these last days. I tell people our church is an experiment. What do you mean by that? Well, we're trying to just be a biblical church. We're trying to just line up with the Bible, not with all the traditions of men, but just what the Bible says. I believe God is going to do a great work in our midst. And you know my personal goal. I'll restate it now. It is my ultimate goal and why God called me into ministry and to start this church. So that on that day when we are raptured and taken up and we're standing before the beam of seat of Christ, I'm going to look each and every one of you in the eye and you're going to look at me and we're going to smile with confidence knowing that we fought the good fight, we finished the course, we followed the word of God, we were obedient and we endured to the end. And with confident joy we'll be standing at the beam of seat. You know there'll be some Christians that make it but they won't be standing there with joy. In fact, our works are going to be judged at the beam of seat of Christ. It says some will have gold and precious stones and some will have wood, hay, and stubble and it will perish in the fire of judgment. But they'll still be saved. But the interesting thing in Revelation 19, talking about those saints, what they're going to wear for eternity is based on what they do now, their faithfulness to obedience in Christ. So you want to wear good clothes for eternity? You better start doing things for the kingdom, because seriously, Revelation 19, it says, and it was given to them robes to wear, and the robes are the righteous acts of the saints. We don't work to earn salvation. However, once we're saved, we work to please our Father. And it could be that's what you're going to wear for eternity. You know, there are levels of reward in heaven. The parable of the sower, the parable, I'm sorry, of the talents. 
Those that were faithful with little, what? Much was given to them. And those who were faithful for a, a little bit, they were given a little bit. And those that weren't faithful but buried their talent were cast out. Obedience is going to be important in the days ahead. Matthew 25, 23, it says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You know you're a slave. A bond slave of Jesus Christ. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I love that good and faithful slave. Faithful there is pistis. For those of you that know Greek, that means what? Simply faith. Are you faithful to the Lord this morning? Are you faithful to your spouse? Here's our annual report for the church to see where you fit in. Before we get into it, though, Philippians 1, 3 through 5, you know once a month we have koinonia. That's a Greek word that means participation, mutual sharing with one another. And it says, I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for all of you. In view of your koinonia, your participation, and the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the rapture of the church, the day of Christ, the beginning of the day of the Lord. The organizational chart for the church we must go over quickly. Can you see that? Yeah. God the Father is in charge. Christ is submitted to him, and he's the head of the church. Pastoral team, the board, uh, Coastland University, the worship team, missions and outreach, women's ministry, men's ministry, uh, pastoral ministries, children's ministry, ushers and greeters, and youth ministry. By the way, youth, uh, at the end of the service, uh, Carlos and Lane want to talk to you. So any uh, high school and younger, I'm going to dismiss you in about five minutes uh, to go out with them. Coastland University, we have an online program. We're reaching people literally all over the world uh, with classes. They can earn their full degree online. Uh, pastoral interns, we have Chris Brunt and Tim who are doing excellent jobs. Chris is actually enrolled in uh, seminary, Bible college, and uh, earning a degree, uh, runs the men's ministry, and Tim's doing the young adult. Uh, we have a, a Jim Beasley who teaches our Greek. He's our librarian. Uh, we have other faculty. Um, one back in um, back east who's uh, joining our online faculty. So that's pretty good. He's a Calvary Chapel pastor back there. Exodus Project is uh, Pastor Brad is doing research to prove that the Exodus occurred. This is cutting edge stuff. He is uh, going to be doing a conference in San Diego in June. So please look them up in prayer. Really cool stuff. Yeah, his budget is like huge compared to ours. <laughs> it's like, wow. Uh, Nautilus program. We have students right now in Ireland, South Africa, New Zealand, Korea, Brazil, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Ghana, India, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Mongolia, Sweden, the UK, Israel, China, and Turkey. <coughs> this little church is reaching a lot of people. So some people measure success by how many people actually fill the pews. That's a stinky way to do it in my mind. Never mind. <laughs> Here we have uh, students in Washington, Ohio, Alabama, Colorado, Utah, California, Oregon, and Hawaii. Um, we have sent graduates from our Bible college and people from this church. Uh, 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 to Colorado, uh, Gary started online uh, ministry, Jim, uh, worship ministry, Jeremy, standing for truth, Stefan started a mixed martial arts chaplain ministry, uh, Keith started a creation science ministry, Eric at helps ministry, Dave a children's ministry, Randy and Tom street ministry, Tom Bully as a worship guy in Florida, Brandon a worship leader, Luke as at Bible college and does worship, Cody is now getting his theology degree and changing that to 
uh, Old Testament studies, Near Eastern, what is it, Cody? Ancient Near Eastern studies. Thank you. Uh, again. And leading Bible studies, Roy is ministering uh, at his college, Brian is an evangelist, Roman Street Ministry, uh, many pastors in Ireland, India, Jose is a pastor in San Juan now, leading a, a Mexican con uh, congregation, who's been one of our students for like five years. Um, Benji's a director of the human trafficking ministry, particularly um, the sex slave trade. Uh, Ryan, a worship leader. Tim, a missionary. Jordan, a youth pastor. Garrett, a director of ministry to teens. Edwin, an inner cities ministry in New York. Eric B., pastor of Sanctuary. Habib, pastor of the gate right down the street. Uh, Tristan and Justin are starting a church, and Tristan was a student, and Justin is a student at Coastline University. Folks, this little church is doing a lot of stuff. Some people wonder, what do I do all day long? <laughs> Pastoral ministries. Uh, Pastor Mark is a full-time fireman. He teaches Founded on the Rock. We're going to co-teach that. We're going to start it fairly soon. And uh, him and Jadine are doing our new couples fellowship ministry once a month on a Friday night. This Friday night is the CJD back there if you want to go. Uh, pastor Chris does pastoral care, discipling in the church and our intern pastors. Uh, lunch ministry. If you've never participated in Pastor Chris's lunch ministry, just call him. Hey, what are you doing for lunch? He'll take it. You know, he's, he, he's, he's good. I, I, yeah, maybe I should do that. <laughs> uh, he's a chaplain for La Habra Police Department, California State Military Reserve. He does in charge of our hospital visitation as well. Pastor Harry does prayer, uh, spiritual disciplines, and evangelism. Month, you know, email encouragements, uh, doing so much, and mainly hearing from God and delivering words from God individually to people in the church. He comes up to you, get ready. Because <laughs> probably God is going to be talking to you. I run the Bible college in the church, disciple other pastors around, and faculty uh, counseling many people from other churches in the area, uh, discipling, mentoring, teaching four to five times a week, chaplain for Orange County Fire, uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary, uh, along with the PSR, Professional Services Responder for Orange County Sheriff's Department, Orange County uh, Intel, uh, uh, Private Sector Counter, what's that called, Mark, that meeting? Counter oh, it's called Orange Shield now, but it's an <laughs> Intel private sector counterterrorism, whatever thing. And so, yeah. Uh, just so you know, I start my day typically at five thirty, and I get done about ten o'clock. That that's the kind of pastoral team you guys have. We are working our tails off for the kingdom of God, and I don't say this for anything. Tim's working his tail off for the kingdom of God, and man, he's just an intern guy. <laughs> all, all the while, and so is Chris, the class, and everything else. So, we have a busy, busy, busy people. Art Foundation, and I, I just need to tell you about this. Uh, we are gonna have a big earthquake in Southern California. Uh, God has put it on Ross's heart and Pam's heart to really prepare. And uh, in the next few months, we're gonna be giving you some sheets uh, on preparedness. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, say the big one hits. Roads are going to be uh, destroyed here in Rancho. The bridges probably could be out. Phones will definitely be out. Um, so we're going to talk about um, and pretty much put together an action plan. So if the big one hits and you work far away, those of us that are in the area are going to make sure or do a well check on everyone in the church. And so we're going to make sure you have provisions. And also uh, provide lessons on simple things like purifying water, things like that. Yeah. And so uh, we're going to be doing stuff on like how to purify water, how to, you know, do all kinds of stuff. So we are ascending church, as you can see from the list of people we've sent out. Sometimes I wish they would have stayed. We would have a bigger church. <laughs> but that's not my call. And if that's what you need, then you should find another church that's big and you can just come in and go. And, but here, what's more family, 
And we're an equipping church to equip pretty much all of your called into ministry to one extent or the other. Living water, oh, I'm going to skip that. All right. So the vision really quick. Um, it's a vision of living water to be a church that loves where every person, regardless of age, stage, status, can feel love, feel safe, learn truth, and be equipped for ministry and go out as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. If you don't feel love when you come to live in water, please, please, call me. Don't email me. And say, you know what? I was at church and no one hugged me or I didn't feel love. And I'll, I'll scold the whole church. <laughs> you know, you, every, by the way, every visitor we get, that's the one thing they tell me when I contact them. It's like, you know what? I really felt the love of Christ in your church. Uh, they, they, yeah, that's amazing. So, it's the vision of living water be a church that heals where individuals, marriages, families, those who are hurting, hopeless, discouraged, depressed, will be embraced with open arms of Christian love, offering biblically sound teaching, encouragement, guidance, and advice. Do you do that? We should all be doing that. Discipling. <coughs> It's a vision of living water to be a church that influences. <clears throat> Folks, God has called us to, I believe, be a leader in the last days on how to really be a biblical church. When you look around at all the pathetic attempts at biblical Christianity and a lot of the denominations, it saddens you. I weep. There's one thing I weep over, and even thinking about it, I could weep, is the state of the church. It's a vision of living water to be a church that trains, where we engage the opportunity and responsibility we have to offer balanced ministry through evangelism. <laughs> Sorry. Whew. Thinking about the church. Ah. Folks, the bottom line is God's not looking for people that are trying to just be lukewarm Christians. He's looking for a church that is sold out for the kingdom, kingdom of God. Where you feel supported by the body that's around you. I pray in this year, we all find our spot. You know, there's plenty of gifts. Some hospitality, some giving. You know, there's some people that God has them in the church because their gift is being able to financially help and support the church. That's a great place in the body of Christ. Heck, just by paying our tithes, we're all participating. That koinonia, that mutual sharing. Everything we do, we all do together. I really believe somehow on Judgment Day, you know, we're all going to stand there and say, as a church, here's what you did. Even if you didn't do any of it personally, in just supporting the church, you participated. We were one body that did these things for the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? So when Albert brings someone to young adults, like happened a couple of nights ago, and she comes to the Lord, the whole body participates in that. It's awesome. Come on up. God hasn't called us to be a culturally relevant church. I've actually had people tell me that the reason your church is so small is you're not culturally relevant. I said, well, what's more culturally relevant than the Word of God? Because it transcends culture. Are we culturally relevant? I think we are. God hasn't called us to simply try to fill chairs. He's called us to make disciples. As you can tell, God hasn't called us to the broad, easy path. He's called us to a narrow, difficult path. Isn't that great? That's awesome. <laughs> you know, some of the people on that path that face the battle more than any of us is these people right here. I don't know why the enemy loves to take out worship leaders. And we've got a solid worship team. But lift them up and keep them lifted up in prayer. 
Um, and by the way, Jake, for not practicing, but the anointing of the Spirit came on you, and you guys sound awesome. Today. I was thinking, man, they must have practiced a lot this past week. When did they find the time? You know, that I was really thinking that. You know, as we end the service, <laughs> I really feel impressed that there's some of you here that feel like you failed. You know, it, it's like, well, I go to church, I pray before I eat my meals, I try to read the Bible, but it, it, you feel like you're not connecting with God. This morning, we actually read the verse last week about Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I was talking to the church. If you hear my voice, Open the door. I'll come in and have intimate fellowship with you. We read last week as well that Jesus will disclose himself to who? Those that are obedient. If you obey me and abide in my word, my Father will abide in you and I will disclose myself to you, declares the Lord. You know, we used to uh, pray for people outside that God has been really convicting me about doing altar calls again. By the way, when we get new visitors, we need to do altar calls. And so this morning, if you have a burden you need to lay down, I really want you to come up, come up here over here by the, bat, the baptismal. <laughs> and, and we're going to pray with you. If you've never truly surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, and this morning God is knocking on the door of your heart, today's the day to say, you know what? I surrender all. I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that, or if you've done it and haven't made a public uh, confession of your faith, today I want you to come over here too. If you need prayer because you're sick, come to the altar. I wish we had an altar. If you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, come to the altar. We're going to pray with you. You're going to meet God here. And I know He's already where you're at. But there's something about getting up and coming forward and saying, I'm surrendering all to Jesus Christ. I need prayer. Now, some of you are solid Christians. Everything's good. You just want prayer. Come on up. No one's going to judge anyone for coming up here. They never gave their heart to the Lord. <laughs> Come on up, we'll pray with you during this song. Amen? God bless you.
I think the awesome thing is that whatever Pastor Harry does during the week, we all participate. Whatever Pastor Mark does, we're, we're all part of the same body. And so don't let the enemy tell you you're not effective and you're not being used. Be faithful in the little things with your spouse. Be faithful. With your kids, be faithful. With obedience to what God is telling you in His Word, be faithful. In school, be faithful. Do it unto the Lord. And the menial job, when your wife says, go wash the windows, and you say, oh man, are you kidding? I hate that. Do it unto the Lord. I do. <laughs> I just sing praises while I watch. All of a sudden, I'm out there having a good time with the Lord. This week, I, I pray that uh, you would just run to the Lord. Next week, fanfare, please. Robert is going to do a standing ovation. We are going to do Genesis chapter 10. <laughs> so we're getting back line by line, word by word, into the Word of God. God bless you. Have a great week. If you need anything, let us know. Oh, hey, by the way, youth, uh, please see Elaine and uh, Carlos in the back. <laughs> Try to read a psalm on the way to church. <clears throat> We're reading Psalm 3. And uh, it said not to be afraid of thousands, thousands of ten thousands of their, of their enemies if they're coming after you. And it's good to know that you know, the Lord has our back against odds that no one can stand against. You know, how many times in the Bible does he help someone to defeat people in, in a situation like that? Where, the odds are so against you. Just thought I'd share that.
Christ.